Our next speaker, Paul Stepahan, is, uh, does the most awesome talks I've ever seen here. He's going to talk to us tonight about the history and the, of the periodic table and why it has that strange shape it has. All right, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. So uh, we're doing this recurring program about the various elements of the periodic table, but we thought for this inaugural event it might make sense to kind of pull back and look at the table as a whole and talk about how it came about. So uh, this is the periodic table of the elements. Uh, it's, each box represents a specific kind of atom, and these are basically all the atoms we've ever observed. And uh, it's sort of like the Lego kit of the universe. If you're going to make anything, it's going to have, have to be made out of these raw materials. This is all we've got to work with here. Uh, and it's not just a list, it's obviously laid out in a specific way. So this is a special kind of organization. For instance, if you look on the left-hand side, you have Li for lithium on down. All of the elements in that row are very, are in that column are very similar. They're all metals, they're all soft, you can cut them all with a knife, and they all explode when you put them in water to varying degrees. So these are called the alkalis. Uh, on the opposite side of the table, you have a column called the noble gases. These are inert gases, they don't interact with anything. Right next to them is the halogens, which are highly toxic. So you have these sort of family groupings. Um, that whole big rectangle in the middle, that's where most of your common metals are found. And in addition to these associations, there are also trends in the periodic table. They're sort of laid out according to weight. So if yellow is light and br brown is dark, these sort of get heavier as you sweep down and to the right across the table. Uh, in terms of states of matter, if brown is solid and yellow is gaseous, then there's kind of a sweep from upper right to lower left where things get more solid as you work your way across the table. And the point is just that it's sort of riven with all these associations and trends. And you can learn a lot about the chemical properties of an atom just by knowing where it sits in the periodic table. Um, so I want to compare this to an older table of the elements. This is what the ancient Greeks believed the world was made of. Everything was either fire, water, earth, air, or some combination of these. So as you can see, we've come a long way. Like, not one of these is right. So the ancient Greeks had basically figured out nothing. And what I want to talk about is the process by which we got from this to the modern periodic table. And to give you a sense of how hard that's going to be, I want to give you an, exa an early example of an attempt to improve upon this theorem, or that system. It was made by Plato in his dialogue Timaeus. He introduces these five shapes. These are the platonic solids. And they're highly regular. If you take any one of these, uh, you'll find that every edge is the same length. Every face is the same polygon. All the polygons are equilateral, and you have the same number of faces around each corner. So this is as regular as a three-dimensional faceted shape can be. And the Greeks knew that these were the only five. So Plato thought, well, maybe these are special. Maybe you can use these to explain why the elements are what they are. For instance, maybe fire is a tetrahedron. If you could zoom in on a flame, maybe what you would see is little elemental tetrahedrons floating around. And the reason fire burns you is because when you touch it, you're actually getting micro-stabbed by all these little sharp things. And maybe the big round one, maybe that's water, because it won't stack up. It'll spill and roll, and maybe the fluid nature of water comes from the shape of these atoms. And maybe Earth is a cube, because cubes do stack well. Maybe the solidity of matter comes from the fine packing of cubes. And maybe the octahedron is air, because something has to be the air. And maybe the dodecahedron with its 12 sides is the 12 signs of the zodiac. It's space itself. And then he tries to do a kind of natural science with this theory. So he looks at lightning. Lightning is fire. It's got tetrahedrons, and it's touching the air has octahedrons, and that gives you a lot of triangles. In fact, if you take two octahedrons and one tetrahedron, you have enough triangles to make one icosahedron, an atom of water. So that's where rain comes from. And I, I really love this theory because it's so wrong. But at the same time, he's trying to do so many interesting things. He's trying to understand the arbitrariness of the natural world with a simple mathematical idea. And he's also doing what a lot of Greek philosophers have been doing up to that point, which is just looking very closely at matter and being like, what's going on down there? And of course, we know what was going on down there. It wasn't little polyhedrons, it was atoms. And we also know how hopeless it was for the ancient Greeks to know about atoms. Uh, the microscope itself was still thousands of years away. Now, when the microscope was finally developed and its magnification was improving, it could have reasonably been hoped by believers of the atom that we would eventually bottom out and see the atoms themselves. But that just doesn't really work out. So let's imagine we have an infinite zoom microscope, and we're going to zoom in on the head of this crustacean. And as we get closer, we're going to see it's got a little diatom sitting on its face. And in the middle of that diatom, there's a little bacteria. But then at some point, the microscope just goes dark. 
and no amount of illumination can light it back up again. Because light, it turns out, has a finite wavelength. And trying to see something smaller than half a wavelength of light is like trying to see something smaller than a pixel. It just can't be done. So we are blind from here on down. And the atoms are down there in that darkness. And they're way, they're way down there. So any information we're going to get about the atoms is going to have to come to us indirectly, because atoms are so small that they are effectively invisible. And it's not like they're well organized down there. They are in violent thermal no motion. They're mixed up in all kinds of compounds. So discovering the periodic table is going to mean sorting out a huge mess that is inaccessible and invisible. So so how do you even begin to solve this puzzle? This is the human tongue. It is an exquisite chemical sensor, and it is one of the first instruments we began using to discover the periodic table. It is sensitive to five broad categories of taste, and these map pretty faithfully to different kinds of chemical composition. For example, a salt is an even mixture of alkalis and halogens, and salts taste salty to us. Sour is, seems to be a, a kind of acid sens uh, sensor. Uh, the recently discovered umami is basically a taste sensor dedicated to the active ingredient in MSG. Uh, the point being, your sense of taste is a chemical sense, and the flavor in your food is the experience you have when you're assessing its molecular contents. One uh, group of molecules we're especially sensitive to uh, are the browning uh, molecules in slightly burnt meat. These are called Maillard chemicals. Uh, and if you look at all the foods we've invented, a lot of them, beer, bread, coffee, chocolate, they're all brown. So why do we like brown foods so much? It turns out that these are loaded with these Maillard chemicals. So you can, in a way, think about the history of cooking as a kind of unconscious chemical treasure hunt, where we're just trying to find means and substances in which we could accumulate massive amounts of these Maillard chemicals. Now, your sense of taste gives you access to molecules that are uh, soluble in water, but your sense of smell actually enables you to pick molecules directly out of the air. And while uh, taste is fairly well organized in terms of chemical structure, odor is pretty much random. This is a molecule of dynamite. Uh, in the late 19th century, a, a man named Albert Bauer was trying to make a better explosive, and he added four carbons to this. And it didn't explode, but it did smell amazingly like musk, and it lingered on the skin for hours. And he went on to make a fortune in the perfume industry. This is Bauer musk. It was the first synthetic musk. And the discovery of chemistry in combination with perfume has really given us a really interesting angle on the correspondence between molecular shape and the sensation of smell. Uh, we are extremely sensitive to the fine molecular structure uh, of the things we smell. This is carvone. The only difference between these two molecules is that in three-dimensional space, they're mirror images of each other. But the nose can tell the difference. One smells like spearmint, and the other smells like caraway. These are aldehyde molecules. They're a long chain of carbons. And if there's an even number of carbons, they smell mostly like citrus. And if there's an odd number, they smell mostly like wax. So you're doing this really fine atomic discrimination, but you're not getting a sense of evenness or oddness. You're getting these weird, affective, sensual feelings of citrus or waxy. If you've ever read uh, professional perfume reviews, there's this really amazing mix of snobbery and chemistry. Uh, this is from a really long review of a fragrance by Bulgari called Black by physicist turned perfumer Luca Turin. Black sets out boldly into space on three axes, a big, solid, sweet amber note, a muted 50s Jarevien floral note, benzyl salicylate, as green as a banker's desk lamp, and finally, a bittery, powdery accord, fresh, a fresh rubber accord, such as one encounters in specialist shops or while repairing a bicycle tire puncture. <laughs> so I really love all the imagery people invoke when they're trying to describe smells. And of course, negative reviews are a lot more fun to read. Uh, this is a terse takedown of Paris Hilton's heiress, a hilariously vile 50-50 mix of cheap shampoo and canned peaches. <laughs> And the important thing to remember is that what's being reviewed here are molecules, but you don't have any sense of what those molecules are. What you have are feelings and judgments and emotions. So the chemical senses are kind of a dead end. No matter how hard you smell, you're never going to discover the periodic table. So we have to approach it with our hands and with our brains. And we kind of measure our progress as a species by which elements we discover. So about 3500 BC, we start melting copper and making tools, instruments, and a lot of weapons with it. This is the beginning of the Copper Age. Later, we, we discover uh, tin. And by mixing copper and tin, we can make the harder element bronze, which lets us make even better weapons. This is the beginning of the Bronze Age. 
Uh, and that dovetails with the Iron Age. And once you're making iron, you can use that to break rocks and make better furnaces. So this facilitates the discovery of all kinds of other elements. So these are the sort of old world elements we had discovered before we started going about things systematically. And there's three of these that had a really interesting effect on us. It's Cu, Ag, and Au. This is a family of metals known as the the noble metals. This is copper, silver, and gold. They are uh, fairly non-reactive. They're fairly rare. They are fairly soft as metal goes, and they're fairly shiny. And it turns out these are exactly the properties you're looking for if what you're trying to invent is money. Now, why do we invent money? Money actually solves an interesting social problem for us. Uh, suppose you and I have a th each have a thing, and those things are equal in value. Uh, but for whatever reason, I prefer yours to mine, and uh, you prefer mine to yours. We're now in a position to swap. And the trade is technically fair, but uh, we both feel better off after this transaction than we did before. This is a kind of psychological miracle called mutually beneficial exchange. And one of the problems with mutually beneficial exchange is that it doesn't scale very well. Things get very complicated if you try to involve more people in things. So for instance, let's say I'm giving up coffee and I want to get rid of my coffee machine. Uh, and what I really need is a pogo stick. And this guy has a pogo stick, but he doesn't want my coffee machine. Uh, what he really needs right now is a chainsaw. So here's a Here's a person who has to, happens to have a chainsaw that they would be willing to trade for a gigantic inner tube. Uh, this person happens to have a gigantic inner tube, which they would be willing to trade for a fez. This person's wearing a fez, which they'd be willing to trade for a large sushi lunch. This person has 64 maki rolls, which they'd be willing to trade for medical attention. This person can administer medical attention, which they would willing, willingly do if someone were to replace their broken pole vault. This person has an extra pole vault, but they're really tired and are in the market for a new coffee machine which is great because it means we have the conditions necessary for a mutually beneficial eight-way exchange. <laughs> the problem here is that it's very difficult for any one of us to figure out that this opportunity exists. And even if we do, it's going to be a lot of work to orchestrate this exchange. So there are all kinds of informational and logistical problems that would probably keep this transaction from happening in real life. This is what economists call the problem of coincident wants. And the reason we invent money is because it gets us around this problem. Money is an object that symbolizes a certain amount of value, and we have all agreed to trade it as though it possessed that value. Uh, so the guy with the pogo stick doesn't want my coffee maker, but he will trade it for some of my money, because he knows that he can turn around and trade it for the chainsaw that he wants, and so on around the loop. Money can break our eight-way transaction down into a series of peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So we can achieve the eight-way the eight tra eight trade without anyone having to solve any of the problems typically associated with that. This is the purpose of money. It increases the liquidity of goods, allows us to trade more easily, and increases the efficiency with which we can allocate our resources. But in order to work, money has to have certain material properties. One of the properties money has to have is that it needs to be durable. It's going to have to go hand over hand, ideally forever. So you want something that's not going to break or dissolve or disappear. And metals are a good option for this because they're fairly enduring, but a lot of them will corrode away. These metals are particularly non-reactive, especially gold. Gold can sit at the bottom of the ocean for centuries and come out looking brand new. Uh, you also want something that's scarce. You can't use something common like rocks and sticks because no one would be incentivized to trade. You can just bend over and pick up your own rocks and sticks. You want something that's hard to come by. And these are relatively rare. Copper is actually not that rare. And this is a good example of what goes wrong when you try and use an abundant uh, substance is money. This is a, a Swedish dollar. These coins weighed up to about 40 pounds. And in order to have a tradable quantity of an abundant material, you need to have a lot of it. Silver and gold exist in sufficiently scarce amounts that a coin is a tradable quantity. Uh, another thing you want is that they should otherwise be useless. The same way you don't want money to your, your money to disintegrate, you also don't want it to get used up. So what you want for money is something that has no alternative purposes. These metals are extremely soft. You would never melt down your gold to make a pickaxe because it would be a terrible pickaxe. And that makes gold especially suitable for money. And finally, you want something you can easily recognize. And these are, these, these are very shiny, and they have actually pretty distinctive colors. So it's hard to make something that isn't gold look like gold. And if you're ever confused, there's actually an antique method of testing the purity of gold. You can scrape it on a pumice stone, pour some acid on it, and if it disappears, it's not real gold. So the capacity to verify gold has a really interesting effect on the problem of trust in trading. In order to have in-kind trading, you have to have some baseline of trust with the person you're trading with. But if you're trading with gold and you can verify it, then it kind of doesn't matter who's giving it to you. You can trade with someone you're never going to see again. You can trade with someone you actively don't trust. Uh, 
gold is gold, and it doesn't matter who you got it from. Uh, the economist Milton Friedman explained this as one of the great, ben uh, the great virtues of money, was that it does not care what color people are, it does not care what their religion is, it's the most effective system we have found to enable people who hate one another to deal with one another and help one another. And whatever you think of Milton Friedman, I think this is an important anthropological observation about what money has done for us. Um, the discovery of metals gave us lots of new ways to kill each other, but it also facilitated a kind of cooperation that would have been really hard to do without it. And once money becomes valuable, it also becomes valuable to try and make gold. So that leads us to the alchemists. Uh, this is an alchemist, bearded and cowled. He's sort of a laboratory magician. He's holding a vial that contains blood and feathers and a weird inscription and a toad and seven other alchemists, and it's all in a fire. Uh, this thing is called the Ripley Scroll. It's 18 feet long when it's fully rolled out, and it is an alchemical recipe for making gold. And we don't know what it says, because the way the alchemists wrote down their lab manuals was in this weird use of symbolism and hieroglyphics and astrology. Uh, but for all their bullshit, they actually did figure out a lot of interesting things. They isolated a lot of the materials that would become the substances of chemistry, and a lot of the lab uh, routines that are still in use to this day. So it's kind of interesting to think that uh, chemistry really got its start as this kind of uh, mystical counterfeiting racket. So one of the great discoveries of the alchemists was glow-in-the-dark stuff. Um, this is Hennig Brand. In the mid-17th century, he was saving large amounts of his urine and waiting until it gave off a foul odor and then baking it down into a paste and then putting it under water and cooking it with concentrated rays from the sun. So he had kind of a urine cake bong and that would lead to the deposition of this white material on the inside of the vessel and when he took it in the dark, it glowed. So his first thought as an alchemist was like, I gotta keep this a secret because maybe I can use it to make gold. Uh, and then when that didn't work, he started selling it to people and after a while it came out that this glow in the dark stuff was made from human urine. A hundred years later, we discovered that he'd actually accomplished something pretty amazing. He was the first human being to chemically isolate an element. That stuff is what we now call phosphorus. And it turns out that you don't need to let the urine go rancid. You can actually use fresh urine and get just as much phosphorus. So, you know, live and learn. Uh, the alchemist had another interesting encounter with ruby. Ruby was one of the five cardinal gems. Uh, and in the late 18th century, a uh, shipment of rubies in Geneva was clearly very fishy, and these are now known as the Geneva rubies. They appeared to be chemically like ruby, but they looked wrong. They weren't formed by a geological process. And uh, there was a chemist named Vergniaud who concluded from this that it must be possible to synthesize ruby. They didn't know who made them, but he started to try, and after 20 years, he came up with a process called flame fusion, which allows him to make synthetic ruby. And ruby's a really great material to be able to synthesize, because it's hard, and it's slick, and it makes a great bearing for small parts. So if you look at the interior of any fine watch movement, you see that it's festooned with all of these little pink dots. These are jewel bearings made from synthetic ruby. Now, one of the things I love about this story is, first of all, it, it helps you understand what an element is. The fact that you can make el ruby proves that ruby isn't an element. It's made of aluminum and oxygen. And the failure of alchemists to make gold is because gold is an element. It's not made of anything. It's just gold, and nothing else can be, can be gotten from it. But the other thing I like about this story is that it shows that the scientists are now taking over for the alchemists. And the father of chemistry was a man named uh, Lavoisier, who Ron talked about. And one way to think about Lavoisier's legacy is that he was the first person to like, finally dispel this idea about what the elements were. By the 18th century, we knew fire and earth weren't elements. Fire was a process, and earth could be de decomposed into all kinds of materials. But Lavoisier really came up with experiments that demonstrated that water and air were not elements. So here's how you prove air isn't an element. Uh, you take a known mass of air and a known mass of tin, you combine them, uh, and then you cook them for a while. And when you take the tin back out, you'll find that the air has lost about one-fifth of its weight, and the tin has gained that weight. So something has moved out of the air and into the tin. You can then use a process called reduction to release whatever gas is captured in the tin. The tin goes back to its original weight, and now you have separated air into two distinct chemicals. And they are distinct. One will support a flame and one won't. Uh, Lavoisier originally called one vital air and the other azote, uh, but he later changed the name to oxygen and nitrogen. And this proves that air isn't an element because you can divide it into two separate compounds. To show that water wasn't an element, he took a known weight of hydrogen and a known weight of oxygen and, com and burned them together to make water. And this proves that water isn't an element in the same way that ruby isn't an element. It's made of two simpler things. Lavoisier gave us uh, our nomenclature for chemistry, which we still use to this day. 
Um, and he also gave us the impression that weight was important. So these are all the elements that were known around that time, and you can start organizing them into weights. So before it was disorganized, now we have a sort of lineage. And by following the mass, we can see how many of these atoms are in different common compounds. And then, as Zeke showed us, electrolysis allows you to basically electrocute different compounds and get new atoms out of them. Uh, and once these join this rank, we can start to see interesting patterns. A guy named Doberaner identified what he called triads. So these are groups of three elements that are very similar, except that they all have different weights. And in any given triad, if you look at the middle weight one, you'll find that that weight is the average of the larger one and the smaller one. So this is the first mathematical regularity that we start to see in material. And it suggests that what we're discovering are not just elements, but puzzle pieces, and that these are all going to go together in a certain way. The person who finally figured it out was a wild-haired Russian named Dmitry Mendeleev. And he was not originally motivated to solve the puzzle of matter. He was obligated to the University of St. Petersburg to write an introductory chemistry textbook. And so he was just trying to figure out a good way to explain the existing elements to students. And he realized he could get a really nice arrangement if he left a few well-placed gaps. Uh, and he had the audacity to suggest that these gaps were undiscovered elements. And the table was so well organized that he could even figure out what properties those missing elements should have. So for instance, this one he called echoboron because it should have properties like boron. He predicted that it would have an atomic weight of 44, that its salt would, salts would be colorless and other things. And in Scandinavia, an element was discovered that was very similar in properties. This is now called scandium, and it fulfilled Mendeleev's prophecy. His other uh, elements that he guessed existed were echa aluminum, which was later found in France and is called gallium, and echa silicon, which was found in Germany and is now called germanium. So we're not done discovering elements, but at this point, the puzzle makers have leaped ahead of the discoverers and are now telling them what kinds of things they can expect to find. Um, so all of the elements we discover now are going to fit into this pattern. So by the late 18th century, uh, we had uh, we, knew that light gave off, uh, we knew that different elements gave off color fingerprints, as Ron sort of pointed out. And one of the nice things about this is that if you make a mixture of gases, these sort of pile in on top of each other. And so you can get an emission from a gas and de deconstruct what's in it. So, uh, A scientist named Lockyer uh, decided he wanted to see what gases were on the sun. And during a solar eclipse, he got this emission spectrum, which had hydrogen in it. And what was left over was an element that no one had seen before, especially that bright yellow mark. Uh, so this was named after the sun. This is helium. And uh, for the first 30 years or so, we didn't know what chemical properties helium had. It was the first element discovered not on Earth. We eventually discovered it in a mineral called cleavite. Um, but meanwhile, uh, a scientist named Ramsey had observed an interesting fact, which is that nitrogen uh, made from air was slightly denser than nitrogen made from other nitrogen-containing compounds. And this turned out to be because nitrogen contained a trace amount of another gas. Uh, he was able to isolate this gas, and he called it argon, the lazy. And he called it lazy because he couldn't make it do anything. It didn't seem to have any chemical properties. Uh, it just floated around not participating. Now, if you look at where helium and argon would go in the periodic table, they're between hydrogen and lithium and between chloron and chlorine and potassium, which suggests there may be a whole undiscovered east coast of the periodic table. Um, so Ramsey did what any reasonable person would do, and he got 120 tons of air and liquefied it. And that little red dot in the corner is the amount of argon in a typical quantity of air. Uh, but a small amount of that argon, by weighing it out with a, a balance capable of measuring 1 14 trillionth of an ounce, turned out to be something else called, which he named neon, the new. And a small amount of that turned out to be something called krypton, the, uh, the hidden. And a small amount of that, weighing in at 11.5 millionth uh, of the atmosphere, was xenon, the stranger. So these are the noble gases. They were almost all discovered by Ramsey. And they're sort of the packing peanuts of the periodic table. They just float around, not doing much. And what you can see is, at this point, uh, the elements are getting really difficult to discover. And until about 1940, it was clear that um, discovering elements by looking around for them was not the best way to find them. Uh, this guy, Glenn Seaborg, created some of the first artificial elements. Um, and he worked uh, continuously for about 40 years. In 1980, he fulfilled the, uh, the alchemist's desire to make gold by uh, transmuting it out of bismuth. Uh, this is him pointing at his own element, Seaborgium, number 106. He discovered so many elements and had so many naming rights that uh, if you wrote him a letter, every proper name in the letter actually had an element named after it. There was Seaborgium, Laurentium. Berkelium and 
Californium, and if you're writing a letter from out of the country, Americium. Uh, when you're trying to look at where his elements appear, uh, he actually had to break the periodic table into two parts, and all of those elements he discovered were actually very chemically similar, so you needed very fine methods to distinguish them. And those same methods could be applied to lanthanum to show that it too was actually 14 very similar elements mixed together. Uh, and this is the modern periodic table, and I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. So, thank you so much. Thank you.